This is a micro SD card, and this is a light switch. Since this isn't a dimmer switch, that means it's binary, meaning it can either be on or off. And because it's binary, this light switch is a perfect analogy for how memory cards work. If you have access to eight light switches around you, that means you have access to one byte of data storage, stored completely in light switches. Now, light switches are obviously a really bad way to store data, but what if you use graph paper? Well, a single sheet, both front and back, is about 341 bytes of data, meaning three sheets of graph paper is about one kilobyte. That means one megabyte of data is 3,000 sheets of graph paper, and one gigabyte of data is three million. That's the equivalent of stacking graph paper up so it's about 210 meters tall. And that's only the amount of storage on an old, outdated memory card. Today, we can get memory cards that are even smaller than this that have much, much more storage. Let's get back to the light switch analogy. If you want one terabyte of data storage, which is about as much as most mid to high level computers have, you will need eight trillion light switches. That'll end up costing you about three times the annual United States military spending budget. You'll have enough light switches not only to cause a global economic crisis, but also to pave the entire country of Denmark. That's 43,000 square kilometers of pure light switches. And yet for about 10 hours of the United States national minimum wage, you can buy all of these light switches compacted into something the size of your pinky fingernail. For $70, you can buy yourself a one terabyte micro SD card. Plus you didn't cause a global economic crisis and you didn't pave the streets of about 6 million Danes who no longer know where to turn their porch light on. So we get it, this type of storage is, is really small. But how does it get so small? It's important to understand how flash memory works, then we can take the concept and scale it down to a super micro size. Flash memory relies entirely on the concept of electrical insulators. Something like copper is a good electrical conductor, but the rubber coating on the outside of the wire is not so much. This is what keeps the current from jumping all over the place in our electrical systems. At a low voltage, an insulator, in this case we'll say it's air, will prevent two things from causing a current between them. Once the voltage is high enough though, the insulator is no longer strong enough, which means the current can jump from one pole to the other. Think of the insulator as a football team's defensive line, and the current as the other team's offense. If you put one person up against an entire defensive line, they're not going to make it anyway. But once there's enough players, or enough voltage, on the offensive side, then they can start breaking through. Insulators and electricity are the same way. If you have enough voltage, the current can jump straight through the insulator. Flash memory also relies on what's called a floating gate. A gate is something that stores electrons really well. It's the same thing as our light switch here. It's going to store whatever its charge is, whether it be a high voltage or a low voltage. Now the floating gate is special because it's electrically insulated, meaning it's surrounded by an insulator. This means if there's not enough voltage in the system, no current is going to leave that floating gate. And with modern manufacturing techniques, floating gates are super easy to manufacture. And they're not difficult to manufacture or super small. But how do you get those electrons into the gate so that it can store a charge? To explain that, I have to explain a few of the parts of the floating gate bit system. There are three places where voltage can be applied and taken away. Those are the control gate, the source, and the drain. Now everything that's surrounding the floating gate is an insulator. This channel connects the source and the drain and is the same voltage as both of them. Now the floating gate is what gets charged and eventually ends up storing the data. To change the floating gate to a negative charge, the source and drain are grounded while the control gate has a high voltage applied to it. Because of this high voltage differential, the insulation is bypassed. The floating gate then becomes charged with electrons. To reverse the process, the control gate is positively charged while the source and drain are negatively charged. Because like charges repel and opposite charges attract, the electrons want to flow from the floating gate to the control gate. This leaves the floating gate with a neutral voltage and therefore a different bit value. Since the system is relatively simple, it's not difficult to manufacture at a super small scale. And because it's at a super small scale, it's even better because it requires lower voltage because the insulation is thinner. I'll be the first to admit that I don't know much about the manufacturing techniques, but it's pretty clear to see that the manufacturing techniques can't be too expensive because otherwise we would see a huge price increase on the consumer end. Now, unfortunately, something this cheap and simple does come with a downside. The insulation between the control gate and the floating gate can wear out over a large number of uses, and so the floating gate becomes attached to the control gate. This means that the floating gate no longer serves its purpose of storing that data. While NASA isn't necessarily going to transition to using flash memory in their very most important systems anytime soon, it's safe to say that flash memory is here and it's here to stay. Because the potential for such large-scale storage in such a small package is too great to be ignored. This is a remake of my third ever video on this channel, so if you want to watch that, it's right here. But otherwise, thanks for watching.